Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore Bapak dan Ibu. Terima kasih sudah menyempatkan untuk hadir dalam diskusi Demokrasi Sosial Baru Jalan Keluar untuk Indonesia. Pada hari ini, Sabtu 9 April 2022. Pada kesempatan kali ini, kita telah hadir di sini dengan di sebelah saya, Profesor Ola Thornquist, Profesor Ilmu Politik dari University of Oslo. Dan kemudian nanti akan juga ada Mas Wijayanto di sini ya, sebagai Direktur Media dan Demokrasi LP3ES ya. Bersama-sama kita akan berdiskusi tentang konsep-konsep kesejahteraan dalam demokrasi seperti itu. Nah, sebelum kita mulai, saya akan mengundang uh, Profesor Dr. Didi J. Rahbini ya sebagai Ketua Dewan Pengurus LP3S ya untuk memberikan uh, kata sambutan dan welcome juga uh, oleh Profesor Oleh. Oke, uh, selamat sore. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to Jakarta, Prof. Oleh Tonkes ya. Uh, we are happy and very glad to have you here having a very intellectual discussion with our uh, friend network here, uh, especially journalists, yeah? a lot of journalists, and then your views, your thinking will be spread in the national newspaper related with these issues. Yeah? Uh, I think this is uh, should be billing well, yeah? Saya coba teman-teman sekalian ya. Isu kita sekarang ini adalah demokrasi sosial, ya. yaitu ideologi eh, politik sosial dan ekonomi yang mendukung intervensi ekonomi untuk mendorong keadilan. Jadi ada peran demokrasi ya, political market demokrasi, and then intervention of uh, political and policy ya to to reach the social equality, justice, and so on. So in short, yeah, social democracy is political and social uh, philosophy, yeah, economic philosophy, yeah, that support political and economic democracy. Yeah. I think this is close to what we call in Germany or in uh, Scandinavian countries, like social market economy, where we have the market and uh, uh, A social market economy, uh, the role of the state yeah, to reach the democracy uh, and justice in the society. Yeah. Saya kira itu, yeah. uh, thank you for your presence in this uh, LP3S. Yeah. And then we will be have a very fruitful discussion. Yeah. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Didi, for your Uh, re welcoming remarks. Uh, a little bit about Professor Ole. Uh, please welcome to our office in LPT Guys Indonesia. He's a global historian and social scientist, a professor of political science and development research at the University of Oslo since 1997. And he got his PhD from Gothenburg and Uppsala University in 1983. And his latest publication is In Search for New Social Democracy. Professor Ole adalah uh, seorang sejarawan ya, dan juga uh, ilmuwan sosial, dan juga mengajar di Universitas Oslo from uh, 1997. Publikasi terakhirnya adalah uh, Untuk Mencari Demokrasi Sosial Baru yang diterbitkan pada 2021. Profesor Ola, uh, LPTGS has come a long way to proliferate democracy in Indonesia. So on February 20, 2020, we had our first uh, democracy school or Sekolah Demokrasi led by uh, Dr. Wija here that seeks for a leader who wants to promote distribution of welfare at the founding fathers of this country aims in our constitution by providing welfare for all. Professor Didi at that time introduced his bandit theory how we as citizens together control that no entity or group in this country will turn into a leviathan 
abusing their power to get more wealth and power. So then we proceed to invite scholars in Indonesia and all over the world that we call Indonesianas to share their research. Usually we're looking for a research that's already done for five years and more, showing political, social, environmental issues happening in Indonesia. And we documented uh, their findings in this, in this book, Dem Democracy, that will be uh, introduced by Wija later on, uh, how the condition it is. Now the results showed empirical evidence based on theories how power is abusing in Indonesia and still continues in. So it is important for us as civil society and also as academics to talk about it, to remind people about it. Now, oh yeah, hold on, hold on. All right, one more. So now, now coming in this year, we are we are going to debate to talk about what kind of democracy is 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 suitable for Indonesia. Early this year, we we started with Membaca Sujatmoko, one of our founding fathers, Indonesia, who has international experience and documented how development use coercive action. And now we invite you also to, to share your views on democracy. So before we start, uh, we invite Professor Didi symbolically to, to share you the book that I've just introduced you. Yes. Uh, Please. Yeah, you have the right. Okay. 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 Oh, sure. <laughs> oh. Uh, yes, so uh, Pauli. Uh, you write with us in this book, uh, Democracy to Tan and you write you wrote a piece mm -hmm. uh, about Kiribaru, yeah, the Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And as the author, you have the right to have the book. Thank so you so you. much. Thank you so much, and congratulations to the uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Baik, uh, baik Ibu, kita akan segera memulai uh, kita hari ini sebagai prolog bahwa ini merupakan sebuah uh, perjalanan panjang LP3S ya untuk mencapai pimpinan-pimpinan yang akan mempromosikan bentuk-bentuk demokrasi kesejahteraan di Indonesia. Kita telah mengidentifikasi ya dari awal dengan teori-teori yang telah dilontarkan oleh Prof. Didi bahwa dan akhirnya setelah itu ada diskusi dengan para peneliti, akademik, dan sekarang juga masuk uh, untuk diskusi tentang konsep-konsep ya di awal tahun ini dengan kegiatan kita membaca sujat moko. Jadi pada kesempatan kali ini kita akan ada di sini Profesor uh, Ola untuk um, memberi diskusi tentang demokrasi sosial baru. Profesor Ola, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. I, I'm sitting here thinking, uh, how long, when was it that I first visited El Petigas and Prisma? And I, 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 didn't, I very much remember that Bedi Hadis was there. And I, and I think that it was in the early 1980s, so roughly 40 years ago. I, I'm happy to be back. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, yeah. so I will I will try to be as short as possible. Is it okay if I talk thirty minutes? Yes, yeah. that's fine. Good. Good. Yes. Good. Good. yes. So perhaps we could begin with the PowerPoint presentation there. PowerPoint. Yeah. Let's see if we can find it. We have translated that one. Yes. yes. So next, please. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I was involved in this uh, assessment of democracy, which we conducted. And, and when the third round of that was about to be completed in the early, in the early mid 2010s, uh, and I was 
I would soon have to retire. You know, in the welfare state in Scandinavia, you're forced to retire. So, <laughs> uh, and there were efforts, the efforts that social democracy was on the retreat in the north as well as the south side. I decided to give up that community work and, and focus instead on, on my own conclusions during, during the studies since the early 70s. These studies had been about to try to understand why broadly defined, broadly defined social democratic movements were not doing well and if, if there were any, any openings. Next, please. Yes, uh, Professor Ole itu pernah dulu 40 tahun yang, eh, sorry, uh, 40 tahun yang lalu datang di sini ya hadir di situ pada saat itu ada salah satu rekan kami Peggy Harvin di uh, Pada dasarnya pada uh, putaran ketiga itu uh, untuk sebuah studi tentang uh, penilaian uh, uh, demokrasi Indonesia yang mau diselesaikan di tahun 2010, Profesor harus uh, pensiun seperti itu. Nah, setelah itu sedikit mundur ya untuk uh, untuk kerjaan uh, kerjaan ke masyarakat dan akhirnya sekarang mencoba kembali untuk memahami bagaimana gerakan sosial demokrasi tidak berhasil dan apa sih uh, yang akan kita cari di situ. So. Oke, okay, thank you. Next please. So, you know, uh, there were two books first. One, one was on, on, on assessments of democracy. That was, that was re rather easy to, 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 to write. And then there was a, what many people have called a kind of crazy comparison between Scandinavian and Indian social democracy and efforts at it. But, but, but we managed. But the third book, which was, would be also written for, for, for not just experts and, and so on, but, but for, for everyone who were concerned and engaged in these issues, that was, that was very, very difficult. Hmm. Jadi ada tiga buku yang telah ditulis Pak pa, uh, pa, pa Ole, yang Assessing Dynamic of Democracy, menurut Bapak itu sangat mudah ditulis. Kemudian uh, Reinventing Social Democratic Development, sebuah komparasi demokrasi di India dan di uh, Oslo sendiri, ya uh, untuk uh, akademik. Tetapi yang buku terakhir sangat sulit ya, yang In Search of New Social Democracy, yang memang untuk expert. Yeah, so, so I, how would one do this? How should, next please. How, how would one study, you know, if social democracy has become obsolete or might be reinvented? So I decided after some time that it was necessary to, to start off with a broad non-partisan definition of social democracy. And I, I went back in history and, 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 and I think one can summarize the ethos of it as a needs-driven development based on social justice by democratic means. Uh, and, and, you know, that's not a, based on a doctrine. It's not like, it's, there's a lot of Marxism, of course, involved in this, but it, there are many other things. And it's not like Maoism or Leninism or anything like that. So I think it has to be defined historically, specified by way of going back to the historical uh, uh, developments. And, and then we end up, I think, with four cornerstones, five strategies during three generations. Mm -hmm. So they are listed here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the first is, of course, about broad interest-based collectivities like trade unions, farmers, movements, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. The second is about democracy, the democratic links between state and society, and the society should be of equal citizens. And, and, and it's not just about elections, there may be other ways of having democracy as well. And, and, and the third is about social rights and welfare reforms, and the fourth is what used to be called social growth pacts, the institutionalization of class struggle, if you like, between where, where, where capital and labor can negotiate on, on, on economic development um, and try to, try to not kill off each other. Yes. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, so basically, uh, Pak Ola itu di sini mengajak bagaimana sih kita harus mempelajari uh, social democracy ya, yang mungkin sudah 
usang dan harus diciptakan kembali di sini ya. Di sini bapaknya itu melihat bahwa harus ada meredefinisikan kembali seperti itu bahwa keadilan sosial secara demokratis itu kan sebenarnya bukan sebuah doktrin tetapi sebuah etos gitu ya. Di sini beliau melihat itu ada tiga hal gitu ya. Kita akan melihat landasannya perjuangan-perjuangan oleh petani, oleh gerakan-gerakan sosial, terus kemudian dari strateginya sendiri, itu bagaimana tentang pemilu, demokratisasi, tetapi juga kemudian bagaimana itu tentang konsep-konsepnya sendiri ya, perjuangannya itu. Memang sedikit di sini ada 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 Marxism, Maoism, and everything, tetapi mungkin memang harus digali lebih lanjut. Okay. So then, then there are, usually I think one can talk about five strategies to promote this no 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 please uh, five strategies to promote this and 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 i think they can be summarized like uh, the first is about getting into the state and and fight capitalism by dismantling it from above you know have have more public services have more you have you have public schools instead of private schools you have public welfare instead of private welfare and so on The second is, of course, to tame capitalism by rules and regulations. You try to, 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 yeah, to regulate it. The third is, of course, to outside the state to resist it from trade unions, action groups, and so on. And the, the fourth is to try to escape it. You build cooperatives and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, the, and the final one is a bit more tricky because that, that is often left outside and it's It's about series of reforms. So you, you, you build one reform upon the other. You may have a reform to strengthen the position of, of, of women's rights, for instance, and that reform increased the strength of women, yes. and then you can move on. If you go back to the, the introduction of, of equal rights in, in Scandinavia, we, th that, is, that is a very clear case of series of, of such reforms. Okay. And, and yeah. And let me just add yes, before yes. you take over, yeah, these, these cornerstones and these strategies have, of course, been pursued during three generations. So you have the industrialization in the north and you have the anti-fascist, anti-colonial second wave of democracy. And you have the third wave of democracy that came up from the, from, from the 70s until recently. Yes. Jadi uh, Profesor Ola melihat ini bagaimana ada beberapa, berbagai strategi di sini ya. Yang, yang pertama itu mungkin uh, dengan membongkar ya misalnya mendorong untuk lebih banyak uh, public school yang gratisan gitu ya seperti itu yang di, uh, itu oleh negara. Terus kemudian bagaimana regulasi-regulasinya tersebut itu lebih uh, pro masyarakat. Terus juga uh, bagaimana untuk melakukan uh, perlawanan-perlawanan seperti itu dan juga bagaimana transformative reforms di situ untuk mendorong keterlibatan perempuan untuk lebih aktif dan juga di Skandinavia itu bagaimana keseimbangan sosial itu telah didorong. Nah, hal ini beliau akan melihat dalam tiga generasi yaitu di mana di awal itu pada masa industrialisasi terus no. antifasisme dan Demokrasi pada awal tahun 70-an. Thank you. Well, if you if you thank you. If you then put it together, next please. If you then put it these things together, you get you get a figure like this. Uh, you know, there will be 20 combinations during three generation. But of but of course, I, I I didn't try to to fill in all these boxes and so on. It was it was a kind of prism that one could use and as a framework to analyze the, the situation. Yeah, please. Yes, uh, jadi setelah seluruh risetnya telah dikumpulkan, akhirnya kesimpulannya ini adalah box, box uh, tiga dimensi seperti ini ya. Dan dari pilihannya itu ada sekitar 20 kombinasi yang terjadi setelah uh, selama tiga generasi. Nah ini akhirnya dijadikan uh, profesor itu sebagai sebuah prisma untuk menganalisis kondisinya. Ya, yeah, thank you. Next please. 
So, but the, se the second, that was, now we have the framework. But, but then, you know, we have to do some kind of, of comparison. And, and it's difficult to compare things experimentally, you know, most similar, most different uh, uh, approaches and so on. So I, 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 I tried to use the, what we use, con con contrast, wow. contrasting contexts, uh, which, is, which is, I think you could associate it with Ben Anderson, by the way, because he always, he always said that his best studies of nationalism and of Indonesia was when he had been expelled from Indonesia and was sitting in Thailand and asked questions about Indonesia from the point of view of Thailand. So that kind of contrasting of context I've tried to use in India, Indonesia, Philippines, to some extent South Africa and Sweden. Yes. So setelah kita uh, mendapatkan frame kerangka berpikirnya, maka profesor melihat bagaimana sih caranya untuk me uh, melihat per perbandingan ya uh, dengan hal-hal yang sama. Akhirnya menurut Ben, pendekatan yang paling dekat adalah mengkontraskan konteks yang telah di uh, diintroduce oleh pengalamannya Ben Anderson. Pada kali itu dia telah dikeluarkan dari Indonesia dan ketika di Thailand, diminta untuk melihat Indonesia dari perspektif Thailand seperti itu. Yeah. So but you know having done that the, the main problem remained how would one bring this together in a in a in, in a book and, and in a readable way it was very very difficult it, it could be turned into a kind of collected works or it could be you know very tense very dense theoretical study nobody would read it Uh, so I thought that I had to do it somewhere there. So what I did was I, I, I began to formulate my research questions, my problems in terms of murder mysteries, yeah. you know, like, like when you write a detective story. So why was it that, that, that the left lost out in Indonesia, but not in India, in Kerala and so on. So this turned into kind of murder cases yeah. and, and then Then you use this theoretical perspective, this approach, only what you need when to solve that case. You can't use everything, but you, you use it to solve these specific cases. Ya, nah, uh, untuk menyelesaikan permasalahannya tersebut, sekarang bagaimana caranya agar risetnya itu bisa dibukukan? Apakah kira-kira dalam sebuah uh, rangkaian tulisan-tulisan seperti itu, atau untuk menggali sebuah teori yang sangat padat. Akhirnya Prof. Ola memutuskan untuk mengambil perspektif seperti menyelesaikan pembunuhan secara detektif. Jadi akan menggunakan teori yang sesuai untuk kasus tersebut. Oke, okay. so then that you, now we have a now we have a crime story, right? Now, now we have a detective story. But But you know, it it it's it is still too long to to get into a book. So what I had to do was also to try or try to almost to almost proceed as if I wrote a manuscript for a film. I, I had to occasionally, instead of writing many pages, for instance, about like in Cake Chill, uh, you know, why people could, didn't trust democracy, but relied more on the other tradition. So I had to tell a story of some kind to, to do that. Well, I interviewed this guy, uh, Jamlian, in 2007 and later on in 2017. And, and he said he had won a village elections. And I said, you must be very happy then. And he said, I'm not happy because, because I would rather have liked to be appointed by the, by the, by the other council. And I said, why, why is that? Yeah, well, you see, because the democracy is captured by the bureaucrats and the, and the, and the business people. So we have to use other tradition, the best thing in the other tradition to measure up against their strength. And there, therefore we have to combine it. So I have to, I use such illustrations mm -hmm. instead of writing too many pages, I hope. Yeah. We skipped it. Well, I can take one more case later on, but take that first. Please. Yes. Jadi akhirnya ketika itu sudah ditemukan masih terlalu panjang sehingga harus 
cari cara akhirnya gimana caranya untuk bikin sebuah manuskrip sebuah film gitu ya apa sih sebenarnya yang membuat orang tidak percaya terhadap demokrasi dan akhirnya kembali lagi dengan nilai-nilai tradisi yang berkembang eh, mengambil contoh eh, salah satu respondennya itu Jang Lian dia menang dalam eh, dalam pemilu yang secara demokratis ketika ditanya Prof Ola apakah kamu bahagia dia bilang saya tidak bahagia saya lebih senang ditunjuk oleh birokrasi karena sistemnya itu memang membuat birokrasi dan juga pemilik modal sangat kuat seperti itu sehingga dia harus kembali lagi ke tradisi untuk bisa mengelola amanah yang telah dia imban yeah. so you know i went back to my I, I, I discovered that I had 1600 something transcribed interviews. So I was searching them for illustrations like this. And then there were, of course, the interviews conducted with demos and Uguien and so on, and my notebooks and photographs. And, and one photograph on the right there is, is, is an old photograph, but it's from when interviewing people in Kerala in India. It was better to show that to indicate the intensiveness of the discussions about democratic decentralization in the villages by, by, by looking at, the, at that picture, then to write many, many pages about it. Yeah, jadi saya ini punya 16,000 trans, uh, transkripsi dari interview gitu ya. Udah pergi diskusi, ke sana ke sini, termasuk juga ke UGM, tetapi akhirnya memutuskan, oke okay lah, kita melihat foto ini saja. Ini foto-foto ini yang akan menunjukkan bagaimana sih democratic de decentralization terjadi di Kerala. Okay, and the, and the picture in the in the below there is another illustration of you know instead of writing many pages about how global capitalism is reaching out to the villages, I told this story about about uh, the the white sand on a reef between Cebu City and Bohol in the Philippines. And the fisher folks had been had been displaced from it. And then in the end of it, as you see, there is a very strange Greek temple. And I asked the fisher folk, why, why, why is that temple there? And they said, well, you know, the businessman who, who, who occupies this strip, uh, he invited uh, some Japanese film uh, team. They, they would they would film a, they would make a pornographic film, a, a cinema. Yes. So, uh, akhirnya ini ada satu foto ya yang sangat men mencengangkan buat Profesor Ola. Ini di Filipin kejadiannya sebuah dampak dari uh, kapitalisme global gitu ya. Di mana di situ ada uh, ada daerah uh, oleh yang ditinggalkan oleh nelayan. Nelayan ini diusir semua karena bangunan oleh para pemilik modal. Ketika pembangunan itu terjadi, di situ ada sebuah uh, bangunan uh, putih seperti itu. Ketika ditanya oleh nelayan, oleh Profesor Ola, apa sih sebenarnya fungsi bangunan putih itu? Profesor Ola bilang, di situ akan datang oleh oleh orang-orang uh, dari Jepang untuk memfilmkan film-film porno. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks, Mom. So, the, the final question is, is there any new uh, uh, knowledge produced when using go, going back to the to the old studies and and so on and i think that there are some there are some new lessons some new knowledge because one is doing this retrospectively through this perspective that i presented this box right so that 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 is the method to do something hopefully new in in the book thank you yeah jadi Pertanyaannya adalah apakah kita bisa menghasilkan ilmu-ilmu baru dari pengalaman-pengalaman atau studi-studi yang lama tersebut. Nah, akhirnya Prof Ola bilang, oke okay, dengan box itu kita akan menemukan itu. Thank you. So let's turn to the results. So there will be three major conclusions that I will tell you about. Next, please. Yes. Uh, the first, the first, next one, next one. Okay, so the, 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 the first, I think, general conclusion is that the crisis of social democracy is global. So if we take the case of, of Sweden, the problems in Sweden began, the social democracy began in the 70s, and they were very much related to the international uh, 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 
questions. You know, that was in the early 70s was when there was a deregulation of the international econ economy. The old Bretton Wood agreements were scrapped. And that was because the, the Americans wanted to, to he get help to finance their war in Vietnam. The second was the crisis, oil crisis, when there was a very quick and, and, and high increase of the oil prices. The third was, you know, East Asian authoritarian development and low wage industrialization, which caused in Sweden, among other countries, a total restructuring. The, in the picture there, you see when the, they, they closed down the shipyard in my own whole town in the west coast of Sweden. Now, Social democratic leaders like Olaf Palme and Willy Brandt tried to counter this by promoting internationalization of the global of the Keynesianism that had been used very successfully in, in on a national level in countries like Sweden. They they promoted, they tried to promote a new economic world order, they tried to promote, you know, north-south partnership, but they failed. And when they failed, the, 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 it was wide open for, for Reagan and Thatcher and neoliberalism. Now, why did they fail? Well, one very important reason was that the partners in the South, the, the second wave of democracy, the anti-colonial movement had been, uh, uh, had, 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 had uh, regressed, had, had, had lost strength. So we have to look at that and understand that. And in the South, you know, these factors also hampered the, the, the growth of, 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 of the social democratic movement. Uh, and then of course came the poor, the, the, the not always consistent support for democratization in the South. So the crisis is, is very international. Yeah, there are three crises yang sebenarnya membuat sosial demokrasi ini uh, uh, terhambat gitu seperti itu. Yang pertama adalah krisis demokrasi uh, sosial secara global. Pada saat itu uh, tahun 70-an Sweden itu juga mengalami deregulasi ekonomi ya akibat uh, kegiatan dari Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods di sini ketika Amerika itu sedang mencari pendanaan untuk mendanai perang di Vietnam. Yang kedua itu adalah masalah krisis minyaknya sendiri dan yang ketiga itu bagaimana itu terjadi uh, authoritarianism berbarengan dengan industrialism di uh, East Asia di daerah uh, uh, kita. Terus kemudian uh, pada saat itu Ono juga punya pengalaman ketika uh, tempat perkapalan itu di, ditutup ya. Ketika itu di tingkat dunia banyak negara itu mencoba mempromot uh, Keynesian, a new, uh, sebuah pola baru di tingkat global, tetapi gagal semuanya ya. Dan pada saat itu uh, di masa Reagan dan Thatcher, dan Thatcher, nah sebenarnya apa sih yang membuat itu mahal? Yang This is, I think, the reflection of no, uh, no new social democracy. Yeah. Yeah, so we are used to do this. Sometimes we are attacked. Like Alpha DKS, they're actually cut, and that's the end of our life. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but it never happened before. So no, maybe this never happened before. Just to give you uh, uh, a brief inspiration. Okay, an update. An update. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Is it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it, is it is it a general power cut or? No, we are already in Zoom now, so we can uh, connect to the participants uh, in the internet. Um, maaf ya, teman-teman uh, LPDKS mengalami krisis uh, uh, sosial demokrasi baru ya. Enggak, <laughs> listriknya mati dan internetnya terputus tiba-tiba. Nah, ini akibat dari tidak ada jaminan itu tadi yang dijelaskan oleh Ole. Uh, kita masih menunggu uh, ya. Ya, yes, sebentar ya, saya, saya online dulu. Yes. Kembali ke Zoom. Yes, I, I, okay. Uh, please go ahead. Yes. Okay, ya. Go ahead. Yes. So, okay. So, uh, but we we the the. Uh, Continue. We we can. Hear okay. You. So Continue. next, you you will have to take the next slide. Uh, so, this means this this when we see the international crisis. This means that we have to find out, we have to solve the first mystery, why the initially very impressive anti-colonial movement partners were weakened and unable to support the efforts at internationalization of, of, of social democracy. Uh, for those who can see the slides, I, I've just indicated two, indi two, two, two pictures to illustrate, you know, the initial strength of the anti-colonial uh, second wave of democracy. The first picture is, of course, from the Bandung Conference, and and the second is actually from, you know, the the installation of the first leftist. It was communist. They call themselves communist, but they were very, very much social democrats. The first leftist elected government in the world, which was in in Kerala in the, the state of Kerala in India. There are good illustrations of the strength. And in Indonesia, of course, the left at the time in 1957 won the local elections in many parts of, of Indonesia. There were liberal democratic elections. Yes, jadi di sini Prof. Ola dalam slide ini ingin menunjukkan bagaimana pada saat itu kejadian krisis internasional ya. Bagaimana sih kita untuk menca untuk memecahkan misteri dari kenapa sih anti kolonialisme gerakan pada saat itu sangat melemah dan tidak bisa mendorong demokrasi sosial. Nah di sini ada ilustrasi bagaimana kekuatan pada saat itu ya dengan pertemuan di Bandung, terus kemudian ada uh, kegiatan uh, sosial demokrasi kiri dan pemilihan di uh, India itu terjadi. Nah, kemudian di Indonesia pada saat itu yang kiri telah memenangkan banyak pemilu di daerah-daerah untuk sebuah sistem kepemilihan yang sebenarnya liberal seperti itu. Okay, so I think it's very instructive. If you take the next, please. Uh, it's it's instructive to to compare the fate. Of Indonesia and Kerala, the, the, both both cases had most have the most successful social democratic oriented movements in South. You know, at the time, the the the, com the reformist communists in Indonesia were were of that orientation broadly speaking, and they were in Kerala and in India. But you know, uh, what happened then in Indonesia, as you know, was 
that the initially successful democratization was, was downgraded in the, in the second part of the 50s in favor of anti-imperial and anti-feudal left populism in the form of guided democracy. Uh, and, and at the same time, West-oriented socialists and liberals also abandoned democracy, saying it was not, it was, it was not time to, 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 it was too early to have democracy. The prerequisites were not there. And, and they were betting on the military instead. And with the Samuel Huntington, you know, the, 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 this Professor Huntington's idea of politics of order. So everybody agreed on, 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 from the left to the right, they all agreed to, to, to abstain from democracy. But, but yeah, anyway. Yes. So, jadi sangat menarik untuk membandingkan Indonesia dengan Kerala yang sebenarnya sangat sangat berhasil ya untuk demokrasi yang pada saat itu uh, ada unsur demokrasi komunisnya. Nah, tetap, tetapi bagaimana sih itu dijatuhkan? Dijatuhkan bahwa pada bagian kedua uh, dari uh, tahun pada saat itu berubah menjadi perjuangan anti imperialism uh, populist uh, guided democracy demokrasi yang diarahkan oleh para populisme dan juga di, di barat sana uh, para sosialis itu ditinggalkan oleh demokrasi karena memang hal-hal uh, yang dibutuhkan tidak ada di sana dan mereka itu lebih cenderung ke militarisme yang di digawal oleh Samuel Hutchinson dalam bukunya Political of Order. Akhirnya semua bersepakat untuk meninggalkan demokrasi baik itu yang kanan maupun yang kiri. Yeah. So next please. So you know, without democratization, it was then very difficult to fight the political and often statist pathways to capitalism. If you don't have any democratic control of the state which they Use, they captured the state. If you don't have any democracy, how can you resist it? So this paved the way for the genocide here and for Sohato's new order. In Kerala, however, they stood tall and they did better. They held on to democracy. But as you know, in Indonesia and the global south in general, and so many other places, that we, there were two decades following when West and East supported middle class coups and authoritarianism. The Eastern uh, countries had their own way of supporting top-down status development. They called it national democracy, non-capitalist development and whatnot. But essentially the same thing. Democracy, they said, was, was premature. So from the left to the right, all negated democracy. Debbie. Kalau misalnya tidak ada demokrasi, sangat sulit untuk memerangi kapitalisme ya. Bagaimana caranya untuk bertahan? Akhirnya terjadilah uh, genosida di zamannya Soeharto di Indonesia. Nah di Kerala sendiri mereka lebih beruntung karena mereka lebih bertahan dengan demokrasi. Selama dua dekade itu Barat Timur itu lebih mendorong uh, authoritarianism oleh kelas menengah seperti itu ada sebuah top de demokrasi nasional yang terpimpin dari atas ke bawah sehingga menurut mereka demokrasi itu masih terlalu muda ya dan memang sesuatu hal yang memang harus di, di semua bersepakat untuk menghilangkan. Oke, okay. so next please. So then then to the second conclusions they relate then to the to the to the third wave of democracy because Then there were new hopes with that new wave. And, and you, know, you know where it started with the, with, if you look at the pictures here, it started in Portugal with, with the, with the uh, when, when they were, the fascists were thrown out. It spread to Greece where, where, where the junta was also fought. It was in Spain, it spread all the way to the Philippines with the People Power Revolution. You remember on the Eds Avenue on the right, picture on the right there. It was, it was then strengthened in Europe again with the fall of the wall in Berlin 
and the fact that we had a poet coming to power in Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel looking out from the balcony. And you had the, the, the ANC coming to power in South Africa, and, and you yourself managed to get rid of Sohata in Indonesia. But, but we know after some time that this third wave of democracy was, was unconvincing and regressing. And, and in Russia, it even turned into imperial Bonapartism and the, and the war we are experiencing now. So why did it happen like this? Yes. Jadi terkait dengan uh, gelombang ketiga ini ya, memang mulailah terjadi perlawanan-perlawanan itu di Portugal itu fasisme ditendang seperti itu. Terus kemudian uh, jatuhnya junta di, di di Yunani dan kemudian di Spain juga terjadi, di Filipina juga terjadi, di Eropa pada Berlin itu terjadi penguatan uh, akhirnya jatuhnya uh, Berlin. Dan terus ada Pak Havel dan kemudian di Uh, di Afrika Selatan dan kita juga sendiri di Indonesia dengan jatuhnya Indonesia dan apa yang terjadi di Rusia adalah mereka jatuh dan lebih ke arah style-style uh, uh, Napoleon Bonapartism jadi kita akan lihat bagaimana lagi ya yeah. next please so the second round of conclusions in the in the book then is is about the causes for for this decay Uh, it was the, the third wave of democracy was unconvincing in the context of neoliberal ideas and economics and social democratic adjustment in the north. So, you know, a basic cause for that was that the democratization, the third wave of democracy was never, and also the second, by the way, was not backed up by social democratic oriented industrial and welfare policies which had happened in Western Europe after the Second World War. There were such efforts there, martial aid, regulation of the economy, and so on. So therefore, we got the welfare state and rapid economic development in, in, in Western Europe. So in the South, we didn't have any inclusive development. There were scattered and weak working classes. And, and it was unfeasible with these social pacts, these agreements, compromises between trade unions and labor. So a general conclusion from all my cases, all the studies I've been involved in at least, is that in the South, class is not enough as a basis for generating and building social democracy. Trade unions are simply too weak. I think we take that. Okay. Jadi akhirnya di sini, di konklusi yang kedua ini, kita coba mau melihat apa sih pembusakannya ini ada di sebelah mana. Jadi pada pada gelombang ketiga untuk uh, uh, neoliberalism ekonomi itu uh, terjadi uh, adjustment ya uh, penyesuaian di, di di utara. Nah di di, di di wave ketiga demokrasi itu tidak di di back up tidak didorong oleh uh, kebijakan kebijakan demokrasi sosial sehingga uh, juga terjadi pada uh, di gelombang kedua di Eropa. Sehingga tidaklah terjadi uh, kesejahteraan uh, pasca perang, perang dunia seperti itu. Nah, di, di utara itu, uh, kelasnya itu tidak cukup kuat, ya, uh, terutama untuk uh, trade union, perdagangan, ya, uh, persyarikatan, persyarikatan itu tidak kuat untuk mendorong demokratisasi. Oke, okay. so the second point here is then, so there must, if the, if the working class is is scattered, if it's not strong enough, then we have to have, of course, broader alliances. But, you know, we, and many of us were involved in trying to promote bottom-up strategies. We are social movements, civil society organizations, NGOs, plus we thought decentralization. But all these efforts have unfortunately proved insufficient. There are many fine attempts, but there is no, That we haven't seen any way of, for these movements to really get together, form united fronts, and, and, and make a difference politically. So bottom-up is also not enough. Ya. Yeah. Jadi di sini itu kelas pekerja itu sangat ter, terpecah-pecah ya, tidak, tidak bersatu seperti itu. 
di sini ada usaha untuk mendorong strategi dari dari bawah ya dengan adanya perubahan sosial dengan adanya LSM LSM tetapi juga dengan adanya desentralisasi tetapi kekuatan ini karena terpisah tidak menjadi sebuah kekuatan bersama untuk mendorong sebuah kegiatan uh, politik yang melakukan perubahan. Oke, okay, so we were we the hope was then of course that that democratization as such would be a unifying concept and and yeah, possibility to come together and open up new possibilities. But but as we know Uh, the liberal oriented democratization promoted internationally as well has been accommodate it has accommodated powerful elites including in indonesia by allowing them to retain their private assets or privatize the public resources they had control of and to negotiate new rules of the game that that made it so very difficult for pro democrats to 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 make a difference to get into politics and make a difference So, democratization has been shallow and also not enough. Ya. Yeah. Jadi akhirnya uh, demokrasi itu kesempatannya itu tidak 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 terbuka gitu ya. Ketika demokrasi liberal itu secara in, internasional mulai melakukan akomodasi, berbagai kegiatan akomodasi ketika mulai terjadi uh, privatisasi uh, oleh aset-aset terus kemudian dikeluarkan peraturan-peraturan ya eh, yang akhirnya merubah permainan untuk pro demokrasi secara politik ya akhirnya siapapun yang mencalonkan dan mendorong demokrasi itu tidak menjadi bermakna dan akhirnya ini sebuah menjadi sebuah kegiatan yang sangat dangkal seperti itu oke okay. you know in the north there had been a lot of adjustment to 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 structural adjustment as it was called to to these neoliberal democrat uh, neoliberal globalization and liberal democratization and so on but at least one example were for uh, to try to get back to make a restart was made actually in Sweden from 2012 uh, and onwards <laughs> and, and the, the, the social democrats managed to get back in power and 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 tried to 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 make a new attempt to to internationalize policies uh, but they failed again within one and a half year uh, because you had this crisis in the middle east and and you know the the arabic spring pro democrats were never given much support so they failed and we had this very very huge crisis of refugees in in uh, in Europe yes. and they reached all the way up to Sweden as, as well and in even in Sweden the social democrats suddenly changed 180 degrees close the border and was trying to to compete adjust to the neo nationalist force again because they weren't strong enough acting strong enough on progressive politics in the south. Jadi di utara itu terjadi penyesuaian-penyesuaian secara struktural ya dengan adanya uh, neo demokrasi neoliberal seperti itu. Nah, di Sweden itu terjadi di sekitar 2012 uh, di mana uh, parti uh, demokrasi uh, sosial demokrat itu memenangkan kembali terus kemudian untuk uh, mencoba uh, melaksanakan kebijakan-kebijakan internasional yang baru. Tetapi apa yang terjadi adalah setelah setengah tahun uh, mereka gagal ya karena terjadi krisis di uh, Timur Tengah. Dan juga uh, ketika Arab Spring itu uh, pro demokratnya itu tidak didukung. Ketika banyak uh, terjadi uh, Uh, perangan terus uh, refugees yang akhirnya nyampe di Sweden itu mau tidak mau Sweden juga menutup uh, pintunya dan akhirnya uh, 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 harus bersaing uh, ne dengan neo nasionalis tetapi akhirnya juga tidak terjadi uh, perkembangan yang sangat signifikan secara politik. So, next, 
So we turn to the final conclusion. Does it mean, does all, do all these problems mean that there aren't any possibility at all for, 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 for social democracy in the South? Well, I, I, I think there are openings. If you, one go back to these problems and, and, and examine the problems, there are also indications of openings. Uh, and I, I think the main opening is that it has proved possible to build you know, broad alliances, to bring all these scattered trade unions, all these scattered civil society organizations, popular movements, social movements together in favor of equal civil, political and social rights if they are combined with productive welfare reform. Productive welfare reform, meaning reform, welfare reforms that also promote uh, uh, economic development. Uh, one, one, one very good example of this was in Indonesia for the, for the public health reform in 2010, 2011, when, when you know, this, it, we had this broad lines in favor of them. The unions, progressive politicians from different parties, unions, uh, civil society organizations and many others came together in, in favor of this. Another example is, the, is from Kerala again, uh, to fight the effects of COVID-19. It's not just to, 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 to have, uh, you know, effective public health and that sort of thing, uh, and, and, and uh, 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 help people to, to physical distancing and all these kinds of things. It's also to help people not to suffer uh, socially and, and to be able, people in the informal sector, for instance, to, to get support. And that was done in Kerala as in contrast to all the other parts in India. And hence, the social democratic oriented left won elections massively recently in Kerala. Uh, this, this, therefore, with this kind of policies, you may also, there may also be a potential to build broader movements so that you can negotiate uh, social types. That, that means actually that you resequence social democratic development. Because in the West, you had social pacts before building welfare states. Here, we may do it slightly the other way around. Please. Yeah. Jadi, kita lihat apa sih uh, kesimpulan terakhirnya ya. Bagaimana kita memberi kesempatan untuk uh, demokrasi sosial. Ketika Prof. Ola itu mengecek semua uh, permasalahan, ternyata selalu ada kesempatan untuk uh, yang bisa digunakan. Yaitu yang pertama adalah kesempatan untuk mensatukan seluruh gerakan ya, dari uh, perserikatan-perserikatan, uh, terus kemudian gerakan sosial, dan juga uh, gerakan politik. Uh, bagaimana ada satu isu bersama, misalnya untuk mereformasi ekonomi yang pro kesejahteraan, terus kemudian pembangunan yang pro kesejahteraan. Nah, kita pernah melihat suatu kesuksesan di Indonesia pada tahun 2010-2011, bagaimana para persikatan, terus kemudian political parties, dan juga masyarakat mendorong untuk kebijakan terkait kesehatan masyarakat. Nah, di Kerala sendiri, Partai Sosial Demokrat di sana itu uh, telah uh, bersama untuk memerangi COVID-19 itu mendorong uh, isu bagaimana secara sosial itu kesengsaraan masyarakat itu bisa dihilangkan gitu ya. Dan akhirnya ketika terjadi pemilu mereka menang telak dan dibandingkan juga di seluruh uh, India. Nah sehingga kita coba lihat pada kebijakan-kebijakan di mana ini ya untuk bisa membuat sebuah gerakan di mana gerakan ini menjadi sebuah kekuatan untuk dapat melakukan negosiasi secara sosial yang untuk melakukan modernisasi untuk mendorong kesejahteraan bagi masyarakat seperti itu. Nah di Indonesia ini kondisinya sedikit terbalik. Oke, okay, thank you. So the last substantive slide now. So if that is possible to build these broad alliances, there are two problems associated with it. 
two major problems if we examine this. The first is the lack of serious or transformative reforms. If you think back to this, this, this analytical approach, it's the fifth strategy, you know, serious or transformative reforms. There is a lack of that. When you have this public health reform in Indonesia, so yes, it was a victory, okay? But when the victory was there, people said, well, they didn't say hallelujah in Indonesia, but, but you know, they said, yes, we won, wonderful. But <laughs> then they went back to their scattered activities, their, their individual priorities for, for the trade unions, for the civil society organizations. So there wasn't a new reform that could continue and follow up on this. There was a series of, so we were lacking that strategy of to unite behind. And the second thing was, so, you know, in the picture there, they, yes, we had very good propaganda for it, but, but you couldn't continue to have that broad lines. Okay, the second problem is what I call the lack of democratic partnership governance. So there wasn't any way of negotiating this in a participatory way. You know, you've seen it now again with the omnibus reform. There is a lack of a concept for partnership governance where people can negotiate these things. So what we resort to instead is a kind of horse trading, right? So various groups strike their alliances with specific politicians or they have informal discussions. They call it direct democracy. They say, you know, but, but it's not, I mean, it's just populist direct democracy. It's not democratic negotiations, representation. We're lacking that. So divisions again. So my final conclusion would be, okay, priority to the broad alliances for serious or welfare reforms, of course, along with civil rights, but, and solving these two problems. Thank you. Yes. Jadi akhirnya kita melihat ada dua masalah utama di sini ya. Ada kekurangan uh, untuk melakukan uh, reformasi secara transformatif. Di sini Pak Ola kita bisa boleh dikembaliin ke uh, slide yang ter pertama itu adalah strategi nomor lima. Slide yang pertama. Nah, right, yang di atas. Nah, uh, ketika di Indonesia itu kebijakan kesehatan itu yeah. uh, tercapai, setelah itu ya udah gerakannya itu kembali ke tempat masing-masing seperti itu ya tidak ada sebuah isu bersama sebuah eh, pendekatan reformasi pertama untuk mereka menyatukan kembali tidak ada strategi ke arah sana sehingga ketika balik ke tempat masing-masing mereka bekerja sesuai dengan kebijakan-kebijakan eh, gerakan masing-masing nah terus kemudian propaganda yang sangat sangat lemah ya dan tidak berarti eh, ada kurang dari uh, partisipasi untuk pemerintahan, kegiatan-kegiatan pemerintahan. Kita bisa melihat dari barusan uh, uh, masalah omnibus seperti itu ya. Tidak ada ruang oleh masyarakat untuk dapat menegosiasi tentang peraturan ini seperti itu. Apa yang kita lihat ini adalah kayak kayak dagang kuda gitu seperti itu. Uh, tidak mau membuat sebuah aliansi. Mereka menyebutkan ini sebagai demokrasi yang langsung, tetapi sebenarnya ini tidak 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 bukan demokrasi apapun ya, sehingga tidak terjadi sebuah penyatuan untuk hak hak sipil menyelesaikan masalah untuk kesejahteraan mereka. Oke, okay. thank you so much. Um, if you take the final slide. They will, for those who are interested, there is a there is a code if anyone wants to, to buy. No, that's fine. Yeah. Anyone yeah. wants to buy the, the book with a 35% discount. So for those who participate in the seminar. So please, if you keep it there for a while. Thank you so much. Baik, Bapak Ibu, apabila ingin membeli buku ini, dapat dibeli ya dengan diskon 35% dengan kode ini ya khusus bagi yang mengikuti seminar pada kali ini. Baik, kita telah mendengar uraian paparan yang sangat komprehensi ya tentang perkembangan sosial demokrasi ini. Saya akan berikan ke, ke Mas Wijaya yang juga bisa dual
presentation Indonesia Inggris ya uh, tentang temuan-temuan kita. Silakan. Uh, Oke, okay. uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Um, yang saya hormati Prof. Didi, ya, uh, Prof. Ole, uh, Mbak Lia, ada Mbak Naning juga, teman-teman yang ada di uh, ruang ini semua ya, teman-teman uh, muda, ada Mas Malik, uh, dan tentu saja kawan-kawan uh, dimanapun, uh, baik di Indonesia maupun di luar Indonesia yang join melalui Zoom, ada hampir 100 orang. Tadi sudah mencapai 100 orang bahkan. Pasti banyak yang nggak bisa masuk juga. Eh, saya akan singkat saja, karena saya lihat sudah banyak yang eh, ini apa tidak sabar untuk memberikan komentar sepertinya. Sudah ada banyak pertanyaan juga. Nanti Mbak Lia, eh, ada Mas Irlambang yang sudah juga menunggu untuk setelah saya nanti Mas Irlambang ya. Dan setelah itu floor kawan-kawan eh, yang lain. Eh, Pertama-tama saya ingin Tentu saja menyampaikan terima kasih ya kepada Ole untuk telah hadir di LPDGS. Menurut saya ini adalah satu momen yang bersejarah. Perjumpaan kita pertama dengan Profesor Ole Tronquist itu adalah perjumpaan pemikiran gitu. Karena saya baru ketemu sama Ole sekarang gitu, tapi pikirannya sudah ada di buku kita di buku Demokrasi Tanpa Dimos ini. Thank you for writing uh, with us ya. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us in the, in the writing of this book. Um, uh, we have a lot of uh, participants here in the Zoom as well, uh, around 100, and uh, many, many comments and questions to your to your wonderful presentation. Um, I would start with uh, a confession. Uh, saya akan mulai dengan satu uh, apa itu uh, ini ya disclaimer gitu bahwa um, I haven't fully read your book because I just uh, received it uh, two days ago, I think. Um, so um, I will not act as a you know um, reviewer of your book, but instead I will share the experience of LBDIS uh, because I'm afraid I will not do justice. Uh, so I will just make comments on based on what I heard and what I uh, have time to read uh, some of the pages. Saya memberikan disclaimer tidak akan mengulas yang membedah bukunya Ole. Uh, saya khawatir tidak akan berbuat adil kalau saya mengatakan mudah, tapi lebih baik uh, share pengalaman LPDGS ya. Uh, so, um, boleh ditampilkan slide saya? As you could see here, uh, Ola, uh, you, we every year, we, uh, we, we write uh, an outlook. This is uh, starting from the end of 2019. This, this outlook is uh, the reflection of um, Slide berikutnya, Mas. Oke. Okay. Next slide. Yang, nah, oke. Okay. So, this outlook is the, uh, starting from the red one, ya. Menyelamatkan demokrasi. This is the reflection of the uh, the situation of democracy in Indonesia. Uh, and we predict the situation in 2020. Um, and the next one is uh, entitled Nestapa Demokrasi di Masa Demokrasi. So, the grief of democracy in the time of pandemic. And this is written in the end of uh, 2020. Uh, together with uh, Mbak Lia, Mas Malik here, uh, Master Lambang, and other other colleagues, uh, Prof Didi, yeah. Uh, and the third one, uh, we wrote together with uh, more than um, uh, 100 uh, social political scientists, yeah, from all, all around the globe, um, combining with seminar as well, in which you also presenting uh, your your work, yeah, during the LPDGS uh, first day. Uh, 19 uh, August 2021. So, um, and this is the last, the last one. The last book is entitled uh, "Democratic Regression and the Resilience of uh, Civil Society and the Civil Resilience." So, actually, there's uh, some optimism, yeah, in this book with your presentation, in which uh, build about building re resilience. Uh, um, So the general conclusion of the book, uh, if uh, I may uh, present briefly, is that actually the um, the situation of democracy in Indonesia is seriously regressing, uh, not 
because of military coup, but because of a politically elected leader who undermines uh, democratic values and democratic institutions. So that's the uh, that's that's how uh, Indonesian democracy is regressing. So one of the factor is uh, indeed uh, uh, against factors. You know, uh, we have agency uh, who are undermining democracies. Uh, who is the one of them is the president himself. And the second reason for the uh, Indonesian democratic backsliding is the um, oligarchy who is uh, who, uh, which are uh, very fast yeah uh, consolidating the consolidating themselves especially after the 2019 election i noticed in your book uh, you haven't touched the re very recent uh, situation in indonesia yeah uh, so uh, i think the situation is getting getting worse in indonesia after 2019 especially um, now, as we are discussing, we have discussion today in, in this office. Um, we have, you know, apart from the problem of electricity, terlepas uh, dari mati lampu tadi. Now we are, uh, uh, only we are, you know, uh, almost uh, approaching the holy day, yeah? holy idol fitri day, Lebaran. And um, in many media, I think everyone uh, feels it now. There's an increase of the Pertamax price. There's an increase of the price of the uh, minyak goreng, you know, uh, palm oil, and also other commodities. Uh, this is actually regular approaching the Lebaran. However, especially now, uh, because uh, the government also increased uh, uh, the tax, pajak penghasilan as well. So that's the... Uh, Actually, we are um, um, we are moving away from 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 what what you may coin as a welfare state. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the, the second conclusion is uh, the second reason is the, the oligarchy that, that is uh, fast consolidating, especially after two thousand nineteen. Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, you know, as uh, scholars have argued that. Um, before 2019, uh, the oligarchy is uh, consolidating. However, after 2019, this is faster because it's also formalized. Uh, you know, uh, we currently have all, uh, no opposition anymore, um, or maybe you can call it political opponent. Yeah, uh, because some some of my my colleagues will not agree that we we don't have political opposition because there's no political opposition in indonesia they say because there's no different ideology in indonesia okay i will say i will coin it as political opponent because all of them uh, become the part of the parliament the third reason of the democratic sliding is uh, this is actually what we we will discuss today i think uh, the fragmentation of civil society and there are many reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons is uh, the increasing repression from the state. Uh, we, uh, uh, and as a result, it's also the increasing uh, shrinking of the civic space as well because of the repression. And also we have, um, you know, some uh, progressive social, civil society activists that is now also become part of the power holders. Um, um, and in campus, uh, in universities, we, we face situation such as uh, the old days in the, during the new order era, Suharto era, in which uh, there is uh, there's a lot of threats to academic freedom uh, in university. So uh, that's, that's the problem today that, that we have. Yeah? Uh, some survey, for instance, by LPDIS and also by some other institutions uh, saying that more, more than half of Indonesians uh, are afraid to express their opinion publicly. So there's uh, three factors uh, underlying uh, Indonesian democratic regression uh, in our books. Um, so uh, in response to your book and to your presentation, when you, uh, when you said something about the global 
uh, recession or regression of uh, social democracy. Um, I, I would say that there's actually an uneven situation, uh, meaning that um, maybe you also have regression in the north, but I think it's not as as worse as here. Um, so um, I uh, in one of uh, seminars I, I I like to 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 say it this way, you know, um, when in in the north or um, in in your place in the Netherlands, for instance. There is a regression uh, in terms of um, there's a regression in terms of uh, the followers of the idea of welfare state. But uh, I lived in the Netherlands for six years uh, myself, and I know the situation is much better there in, uh, compared than here in terms of uh, economic equality, for instance. Yeah, uh, every everyone um, they. They, they go everywhere by train, by public transportation, or, or by cycling, right? Um, uh, I live uh, with a landlord in Maastricht, uh, in a city in Maastricht, in the Netherlands, and the house there, all of the house are the same. So, you know, the, the, the state regulate uh, negara mengatur supaya rumah-rumah di sana, satu sama lain itu sama, gitu. Semua orang naik sepeda, misalnya, ya. Yeah? Uh, termasuk profesor, termasuk perdana menteri misalnya, uh, jabat. Jadi transportasi publik itu digunakan. Ke, saya punya tetangga, seorang kakek tua, usianya 70 bulan tahun. Uh, setiap setahun sekali dia bis, uh, dia pengangguran sejak, sejak usia 55 tahun ya, 60-an lah. Tapi dia bisa hidup nyaman, uh, dia bisa operasi jantung setahun sekali, ya. Uh, setiap salah sore saya masih ingat dia. Uh, apa menangis di ruang tengah apartemennya sambil nonton TV dan minum wine. TV-nya bersih terlalu novela. Uh, dia adalah seorang uh, kayak tua yang gay ya gitu. Nah, there is no way that we can imagine in Indonesia seorang yang pengangguran, you know, uh, un unemployed person, old people can survive and can enjoy the, 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 that kind of uh, standard of living. Uh, di Indonesia kita tidak bisa membayangkan ada seorang pengangguran kayak tua bisa hidup nyaman seperti itu ditanggung oleh negara gitu. Ya, yeah. uh, di, di Indonesia tidak ada uh, hal seperti itu misalnya. Uh, um, this this is also um, um, so when when I uh, when I read your book about the you know the the, the regress or uh, the, the global regression or uh, the the uh, the increasing uh, or the decreasing support of uh, to the welfare state. Uh, I don't think that in Indonesia uh, 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 we can compare it in Indonesia because we, we don't have it even yet. That, that will be my first uh, comment. Uh, the second one will be, uh, what's the problem actually here? Uh, it's the problem in Indonesia that we don't have this concept of uh, social democracy or may, maybe you say it as a new social democracy. Because in our constitution, actually, it's already clear there. Uh, you know, uh, if the constitution is interpreted uh, progressively, uh, we 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 talk about you know uh, hum, uh, human rights there, and we have uh, uh, we also regulate about uh, um, bumi dan air dan kekayaan alam yang ada di dalamnya digunakan untuk uh, sebesar besarnya kemakmuran rakyat. Yeah. So actually, this is for the public. We. Uh, the constitution itself, I think we have the spirit, yeah, to uh, to create um, uh, economic equality. But the problem is um, uh, we we do not implement it. That's that's what I what uh, what that I uh, my impression, yeah. Uh, so uh, the problem is that we 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 are like the idea. Or we actually uh, have problem in the in terms of implementation, or or maybe both. Maybe uh, you can uh, um, um, provide comments, eh? more nuanced uh, comment about it, or, or you can uh, uh, further elaborate it. <clears throat> um, that would be my uh, second point, yeah, to uh, uh, to your uh, to your uh, book. 
And the last one, uh, jadi yang pertama tadi adalah uh, terkait dengan uh, meskipun uh, Ole mengatakan bahwa uh, saya sambil menerjemahkan sendiri ya karena Mbak Lia kan tidak akan menerjemahkan meskipun uh, secara global uh, idea dan praktik uh, sosial demokrasi itu mengalami penurunan gitu. Idea itu artinya tujuan terhadap ide ini dan praktiknya. Uh, uh, praktik atas konsep ini mengalami kemunduran tapi sebenarnya tidak bisa disamakan antara uh, South dan North gitu. Uh, saya sering mengumpamakan bahwa uh, di Indonesia uh, situasinya itu kalau misalnya kita bisa bicara tentang demokrasi yang mengalami kemunduran itu sudah kita kebanjiran seleher gitu. Jadi kalau mundur lagi ya tenggelam kita. Gitu. Kalau kalau di kalau di uh, Eropa barangkali ya um, baru mau kebanjiran gitu, baru mau sampai kaki. Gitu. Jadi beda situasinya. Uh, yang kedua adalah uh, masalah dari tidak adanya demokrasi uh, sosial. Demokrasi sosial ini kan sebenarnya bisa uh, kalau kita buat simple ya untuk teman-teman jurnalis, itu kan demokrasi yang mengutamakan keadilan ekonomi gitu. Ya atau demokrasi ekonomi kadang namanya atau demokrasi kesejahteraan gitu. Nah, uh, apa uh, demokrasi kesejahteraan ini uh, itu juga juga sama ya. di Indonesia dan masalahnya adalah apa kita tidak tidak punya konsepnya idenya atau kita tidak tidak mengimplementasikannya kalau menurut saya sebenarnya di konstitusi sudah kita atur gitu cuman kita tidak tidak konsisten mengimplementasikannya kita mendapat mendapat pak oleh masalahnya di konsep atau di di apa itu di praktik ya nah yang terakhir saya ingin menyampaikan so my my last comment would be Uh, your idea, but strategy to build aliens, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, dismantle from above, tame the, um, yeah, uh, five strategies there, yeah. Uh, my question would be, how, uh, from what you have learned, uh, the, from decades of your life, yeah, um, uh, dismantle from above, uh, f- for now in Indonesia, it's, It's like uh, it's hard to imagine, yeah, because uh, um, we have the trend of the elites, the above. Uh, they uh, they re- uh, they undermine the, the 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 voice of the people. That's why the the book is entitled "Democracy and Pademos." Uh, the oligarchy uh, recently, for instance, uh, uh, making some um, some problematic uh, policies like. Uh, omnibus law and uh, the moving uh, of the capital, yeah, the new capital, uh, and the second term by rules and regulations. Um, we actually have regulations, I think, but uh, the the rule of law is is not is not uh, so good. Resist from outside the state, uh, I think this is good. Uh, escape by regulations. So um, I would like to talk specifically about this. Your interesting idea about. Races from outside the state and escape by social actions. Uh, you write in your book, I, I guess here, yeah, in this in this in this book, I, sorry, about uh, the new left, Kiri Baru, and you you related to 1965. Uh, we actually discussing what is the root actually of uh, the lack of uh, civic regression, yeah, or civil resistance uh, in Indonesia. Uh, you. Uh, my impression is you argue it's it go it goes back to 1965 when there's a repression, yeah. There's a massacre to civil protest. Uh, how do you think, uh, or what strategy that you can suggest to to um, to build, yeah, more support from the grassroots today? Because uh, in a, in a period when the elites is so strong and they are. Um, Uh, they are in aliens uh, together, for instance, to weaken the uh, in, anti-corruption, nation, uh, inter- national anti-corruption body uh, uh, and many other problematic policies. Uh, what can we do uh, to uh, to help uh, encouraging the civil resistance? Uh, in our book here, uh, the hope comes from the digital, uh, from the internet. There's a resistance uh, we found in this uh, in this book 
uh, from civil society protesting in the internet, and we count we coin a term um, digital citizenship. So the social media uh, enable uh, people public to protest and to build alliance, despite uh, there are also many digital repression. Uh, jadi poin saya yang ketiga adalah uh, bagaimana oleh punya saran uh, untuk mendorong uh, apa konsolidasi masyarakat sipil untuk menandingi uh, oligarki yang juga telah mengalami konsolidasi. Uh, jadi kan problem dari demokrasi Indonesia kan uh, ketika oligarki melakukan konsolidasi dengan cepat masyarakat sipil tergopoh-gopoh untuk menandinginya. Nah, uh, bagaimana untuk membangun uh, koalisi masyarakat sipil yang kuat gitu. Nah, di buku ini uh, LPDGS me- menemukan gitu bahwa sebenarnya internet ya sosial media bisa menjadi harapan gitu karena resistensi masyarakat sipil itu eh, tampak selalu ada selalu muncul di internet gitu di sosial media eh, seperti muncul dalam konsep eh, digital citizenship eh, ya, eh, keluargaan digital gitu tapi eh, terus saja eh, masih masih butuh eh, masih butuh eh, masih butuh eh, langkah panjang ya untuk sampai pada eh, Um, kemampuan untuk memaksakan gitu agenda-agenda progresif kepada elit oligarki kira-kira begitu itu poin terakhir saya uh, terima kasih uh, uh, um, oleh uh, terima kasih uh, mbak Lia assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, just a few words about uh, what what's happening in in the north. What's happening? I can't I can't cover the entire north, of course, but I uh, but I can I can I can speak for for. I, I use Sweden as an example. Sweden used to be a paradigmatic case of social democracy uh, globally. And I can with 100% confidence say that it is regressing. Um, you see, the level of inequality is increasing steadily. If you go out in the, in, in the country, you will of course see, you won't see any starving people or, well, there are a few, but you won't see anything like that. You, won't, you will not of course see uh, problems of on the level of, of, of say Indonesia or Northern India or something. But the level of inequality, it, there is no doubt it has increased. We have now a young generation, which is the first young generation since perhaps the 1930s that is not getting, cannot look ahead to get it a little bit better than, than their, their parents. This is the first time since something like the 1920s. Uh, the level of uh, uh, precarious, uh, precariousness in employment, in, in standards of living is, is coming down and so on and so forth. This, this is not just a matter of sort of, you know, <laughs> different ways of interpreting this, what is happening. This, this is, these are facts. There is no doubt about it and, and nobody, actually sort of say, uh, speak against that fact. What we can debate is how do we handle it? And the problem for social democracy, for social democratic oriented movements to handle it is so far, has unfortunately so far been trying to adjust to global global neoliberalization and in response to the uncertainty to the new nationalism to become increasingly inward oriented. And that I think is the main problem uh, for social democracy in the North. It needs to be more internationalized. We need to you know, return to the attempts made by, not the same attempts that's in, that, that Olof Palme and Willy Brandt did, but we need to mm-hmm. return to a globalization, internationalization of social democracy. Otherwise, there won't be any alternative to the, to the neo-nationalism, which we are now seeing getting stronger and stronger in Europe. We even have a war going on. Yes. Can, 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 okay. yes. Please. Uh, but 
dari paparan Makija, Profesor Ola lihat apa sih yang terjadi di utara? Beliau melihat di kacamata yang dekat tadi, Sweden gitu ya. Bahwa pada dasarnya di sana juga demokrasi sosial itu sedang mundur. Ada kenaikan ketimpangan, tetapi tidak sampai melihat ada orang kelaparan di jalan. Gitu. Dan saat ini mereka adalah generasi pertama yang mengalami perasaan bahwa mereka tidak akan baik dari orang tua sebelumnya seperti itu. Nah yang menjadi masalah ini di sana itu tidak faktanya tidak ada yang mendebarkan atau mengutarakan permasalahan eh, pemunduran eh, sosial demokrasi ini. Yang terjadi adalah semua mencoba untuk eh, melakukan adjustment ya penyesuaian penyesuaian dengan neoliberal secara global gitu. Nah kalau misalnya neoliberal itu adalah secara global maka profesor Oli juga harus lihat kalau sosial demokrasi mau berhasil juga harus perjuangan di tingkat global juga seperti itu. Sehingga uh, sosial demokrasi sosial menjadi alternatif solusi dari permasalahan di dunia ini. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I, I, I of course agree with what you're saying about that, that there are fine ideas put forward in the constitution and all that. But, and, and, and that's an achievement. But, and you say, okay, implementation is the problem. And that's what we are all talking about. I mean, when, I, when I'm trying to write uh, this book and so on, it is about implementation. It is about forming the movements, building the organizations, uh, you know, developing the strategies and so on, that's why. So what I was perhaps missing a little bit in your presentation was, is that all these uh, slide backs, all these regression, all that regression, which, which uh, we are talking about in Indonesia, and which I, by the way, I, I, I bring it up to the omnibus law and so on in the book as well. Uh, all of that, I think, I think we are missing out if we are saying that the problem is that a number of people followed Jukovi into the palace and are trying to have a kind of institutional activism from within uh, and, 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 and sort of put the blame on them. Uh, I, I, I fail to realize that that is the major problem and that the, the major problem in my way of looking at it is the lack of popular movement, which backs, which can back up such reform initiatives. And we had, we had elements of that with the public health, the campaign for the public health reform, with the attempts by, you know, to form broad alliances for livable cities. It was not just in Jakarta. It was not just in in Solo. It was, for instance, by Handoko in 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 in, in North Java. Uh, there were there were there were many attempts like that, and they missed out. And we need to examine why that happened, not only sort of put the blame on the people who are sitting up there because they can't form a movement, they can't transform society. But what they can do with being embedded in a movement is to develop comprehensive reform proposals, similar to the public health reform, which we can build a movement around. I don't mind your idea about e-democracy uh, e and people being active on the net, but I do think we have to learn from the, from the Arab Spring that you don't change society by, by internet. You don't do it by clicking your mobiles and Facebook accounts. You have to organize, you have to build movements. It's, it's just as it was in the 1930s, in the 1950s, or whenever. We have to, we have, we have to use me social media, but we do have to organize and, and build movements. Otherwise, it won't happen. That's the only that's the only source of power we have. So combining, you know, the demands for civil rights, build the movements, but with demands for for broader welfare reforms and that sort of thing. So we can unite around that. I, th I, th I think it still makes sense. Sure, use media, but that's not a substitute for organization. 
I may sound like a dinosaur, but I think that's the lesson, historical lesson. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Uh, jadi masalahnya di sini adalah uh, kita itu tidak ada gerakan popular yang akan mendorong terjadinya reformasi sosial. Kita lihat sebenarnya Indonesia pernah cek untuk reformasi uh, kesehatan masyarakat di tahun 2010-2011 ya. Ketika itu gerakannya itu tidak hanya di Jakarta Solo, tetapi mulai di mana-mana. Mereka bersatu. Tapi setelah itu mereka memisah kembali dan harus dicari apa sih membuat orang tidak bisa kembali seperti itu. Nah, Prof. Ola mengingatkan sama Mas Wija bahwa belajar dari Arab Spring, kita tidak bisa membuat gerakan sosial dari internet. Harus dimobilisasi gerakan tersebut. Dengan isu yang sesuai untuk reformasi, sehingga ini menjadi sebuah kebuatan. Isu-isu untuk hak-hak sipil, isu-isu untuk reformasi di tingkat yang lebih global, dan bagaimana isu-isu ini adalah isu-isu yang nomor satu gerakan-gerakan ini. Nah, itu adalah pelajaran Prof. dari sejarah. Okay, I, 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 I'm sure there are many more people who would like to ask questions and yeah. come in. So yeah. I should shut up for the time being. Yes. So uh, next. I will give to my colleague, uh, Mas Hermambang here. We both uh, we both lead the Center for Demo uh, Law and Democracy, and we just finished advocating a case in Wadas where uh, a, a group a village was oppressed here by using uh, the police, and uh, we just uh, we just had some advocacy work there. Go ahead, Mas Hermambang. Masalah yang Indonesia dan Inggris. Ya, Mbak Lian, terima kasih. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me. Actually, uh, Bung Wija pushing me to speak in this forum. <laughs> uh, While well, I really, I was really enjoying uh, listening uh, Prof Ole. Uh, selamat sore, uh, Prof Ole. Uh, Prof Didi, Bung Wija, dan kawan-kawan semuanya. Uh, I apologize, Prof Ole, for not attending directly to see you uh, in Jakarta. <laughs> well, our last meeting was really uh, lovely when you uh, drive from uh, Swedia to Norway, to Oslo, just for attending my uh, lecture in Oslo. And uh, now I could not make it uh, coming to Jakarta because of Uh, teaching uh, lot, yeah. Uh, that is the problem also in Indonesia. We have to teach uh, during week weekend days. <laughs> uh, I have a few comments, uh, three comments, and of course uh, this is opportunity also for me to uh, uh, to uh, to have a question for you. Uh, my first comments. Uh, I I I was really uh, interested with your uh, last. Uh, uh, last conclusion about the problems uh, with with this situation is more political rather than uh, structural, and uh, lack of series of transformation transformative reforms, lack of democratic partnerships as a alternative to populism, and uh, you showed the picture as well, and uh, I'm. Uh, Uh, quite familiar with the picture in the last slide, uh, Said Iqbal, Surya Chandra, and Jamaluddin. <laughs> Perhaps I would recommend you to check uh, where are they, uh, <laughs> and then uh, what their political uh, preference uh, to change the situations, and why they uh, did like that. Uh, it's It might be uh, interesting uh, Uh, discussion also to update uh, our forum today yeah because they are really uh, different situations in uh, in bringing the message of uh, political alternative yeah, in indonesia uh, of course uh, election is very vital uh, because uh, my argument is uh, the the election is the source of modern authoritarianism because of first uh, political cartel Uh, still exists and uh, getting stronger. And second one, uh, corruption, systematic corruptions uh, in the state institutions. 
uh, what we have seen uh, 2014 and 2019 reflecting uh, those uh, situations while uh, i think uh, phd thesis of kruskido ambardi already mentioned about the uh, cartelized party system or uh, Muhammad Nur Hasim from Lipi already mentioned about the uh, cartel coalition. And this uh, situation actually sort of like uh, the way to enter the uh, political formal representative in the state institutions. And they can hijack everything. Uh, if you read uh, Tempo uh, this morning, actually they started to make a uh, sort of like revision of uh, lawmaking uh, law. So uh, as, as we have known that actually the constitutional court asks the parliament and uh, presidential uh, president uh, to, uh, to follow the, the rules, especially nine recommendation, but the parliament and, pre, uh, the, and the government uh, change the law. So <laughs> it means that I don't know what is in English, uh, buruk muka uh, uh, cermin di belah, yeah. So some things that is not uh, really targeting the or uh, not obeying the constitutional court rules. Uh, hence, I think we have to look at new subtype authoritarianism model in Indonesia. Uh, since uh, I, I I felt that this is really important to see, and then. Uh, from where we can start. Yeah. Uh, this one is my first comment. The second one, what we are facing now, uh, learning from Kasus Ten, actually, uh, the, the, the problem with the, the civil liberties in Indonesia, which is related to uh, repression uh, through uh, technology or media. And uh, the problem in that regards, actually, manipulating. Uh, falsehoods, of course, and uh, contra narrative uh, until the problem of uh, what is that? Uh, mendangkalkan informasi, sort of like uh, 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 making making the informations uh, not truth appears in the context of public discourse. Yeah, and then uh, the law, of course, can be used uh, abusively. And uh, they use also, I mean, they means uh, the elites uh, can organize about the uh, those those who um, play importantly to change the discourse in public by uh, employing the buzzers, cyber troops. I, I think Vija should mention again this uh, really important uh, finding about the cyber troops and many other excessive uh, enforce. The problem is misinformation or disinformation. Uh, the truth can be easily uh, misused. Uh, so formally in the uh, state constitutional system can be hijacked easily, while in the public discourse also can be hijacked easily. That is my second comment. And uh, this is inspired by Kasus Ten, talking about liars, falsehoods, and free speech in the age of uh, deception. My uh, third comment, this is about resistance, national local resistance for democratizations. Uh, you are rightly mentioning about the Handoko in Batang, uh, but perhaps you uh, also aware uh, the Aksi Kamisan, yeah, one of the longest human rights movement in Indonesia, inspired by the uh, what is that uh, mothers of the Plaza de Mayu. Uh, I would say this is really uh, this is a really important uh, social movement in Indonesia because it made it could make a sort of like a, a center of gravity to criticize uh, systematic impunity consistently every Thursday and also making solidarity from uh, uh, any corner of social movement in Indonesia when they are in Jakarta. And uh, other local, but it can be national, uh, perhaps we can uh, refer to the Safe Wadas movement or uh, the Safe Kendeng movement, uh, two really movements in uh, Central Java, uh, transforming strategy to change the situations, at least farmers, small farmers, or indigenous community. And they could resist 
uh, the rights and livelihood. Although uh, sometimes I feel that it's really uh, a difficult or uh, it, it's very hard. Yeah, the barrier is very uh, uh, dangerous for them. But because of these two social movement, actually can uh, you know can uh, transform because from this movement they involve academics they involve students they involve uh, 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 arts yeah filmmakers and many others so this is like sort of another center of social movement at locals so different to the national one and locals and they are really in combining yeah uh, in in solidarity making solidarity for uh, struggling for uh, human rights on enhance uh, I really uh, consider this is uh, uh, important uh, situ uh, important social movement in Indonesia nowadays. Uh, this is my comments in in response to your uh, last uh, slides. Yeah, uh, and uh, I have uh, two questions actually. I would like to know uh, perhaps from uh, this answer, I uh, we could learn yeah uh, about the role of uh, of course uh, intellectual. Uh, or uh, intellectual or um, uh, the movement on uh, academic freedom because it seems absent in your uh, explanations and I would like to know who do you see the role of uh, academics or intellectual activism or scholarly activists in uh, Kerala, uh, Sweden and also uh, perhaps you can also elaborate on Indonesia if you uh, see also the importance of that. And then the second one uh, who do you see uh, the possibilities for new social democracy in Indonesia, given the situations of uh, the turn to authoritarian uh, models uh, and even autocratic or illiberal legalism, uh, everything they can uh, take uh, formally, legally, constitutionally. And then uh, from there, what do you think? Who, who can initiate? actually to resolve the problems perhaps a uh, lesson learned from india uh, or from sweden yeah uh, of course uh, it will be uh, valuable insights from you to learn about the new social democracy in uh, this uh, situation thank you okay oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, nah, boleh, nah, boleh, nah, boleh. Nah, Singkat ya. Uh, nah, baik. Biar, biar jurnalisnya, uh, biar teman -teman jurnalis bisa. Ah, ya, ya. Jadi okay. komentar pertama saya itu sebenarnya mengacu pada slide terakhirnya. Uh, pemilu itu sumber otoritarianisme modern uh, karena dibuktikan dengan kartelisasi politik dan korupsi sistemik. Kemudian kita menyaksikan 2014-2019 itu kan cuma menghadapkan head-to-head uh, -head, ya uh, model politik royoan lah ya. Uh, yang memperlihatkan apa yang ditulis oleh Muhammad Nur Hasim soal koalisi kartel dan juga kartelis party system menurut Kurs Kido Ambardi. Dan ini menunjukkan bahwa otoritarianisme itu bisa berangkat dari pemilu dalam konteks Indonesia. Sementara saya ingat ya, Bung Ole, Prof. Ole ini sudah bicara soal building block dan itu sangat menarik ya dalam perkembangan gerakan demokrasi. Yang kedua, komen saya yang kedua itu soal represi dalam era manipulasi dan kita tahu bahwa e, cara represi hari ini itu tidak membungkam dengan membunuh seperti Marsina atau dibungkam, dibredel, dan seterusnya. Tapi serangan dengan cara manipulasi, e, kontra narasi, dan menghambat hingga mendangkalkan informasi. E, caranya ya mengerahkan buzzer, cyber troops, e, dan eksesif penggunaan kekuatan e, yang sebenarnya ada di pemerintahan itu sendiri. Sehingga hasilnya misinformasi. Komen yang ketiga, saya ingin merefleksikan nasional dan lokal uh, resistance ya uh, dalam demokrasi, aksi kamisan dan safe wadah, safe kendeng. Uh, yang itu menurut hemat saya uh, memberi pembelajaran luar biasa buat gerakan sosial di Indonesia hari ini, baik di level nasional maupun lokal, karena bukan karena aksinya itu sendiri, tapi bangunan solidaritas yang mentransformasi gerakan yang begitu luas, baik sosial, politik, budaya, hukum, semuanya bergabung, pembuat film, ak akademisi, melibatkan kampus, dan seterusnya. Itu menurut saya luar biasa dan itu modal dalam pergerakan. Dan pertanyaan saya dua, menurut oleh 
itu uh, apa yang uh, uh, menarik dari pergerakan intelektual dalam kasus India, Australia, dan juga uh, di Swedia, terutama kaitannya dengan uh, peran intelektual. Yang kedua, atau mungkin jangan-jangan nggak ada peran intelektual. <laughs> atau yang kedua, bagaimana melihat uh, demokrasi sosial baru di Indonesia dengan uh, konteks uh, sekarang yang uh, mengarah ke otoritarian ataupun autokratik legalism, siapa yang bisa menginisiasi pergerakan itu? Demikian. Thank you uh, very much. <coughs> I think I, in response to your your exciting comments, I I, um, I I would like to focus on what you say about the role of of, of intellectuals, of, of scholars, and and so on. Uh, of course, I, I try to write about this in the book as well. Uh, uh, in in historical perspective, you know, the I, I I try to recall the importance of intellectuals in the in the in the Indonesian democracy movement way back in time and, and, and onwards. Uh, and I, I also do this with regard to the Philippines and, and, and particularly perhaps Kerala, because, you know, uh, Kerala has relied uh, very, very much on historically on not just uh, peasant movements and trade unions, but in every village already in the 30s, the progressive movement included a library movement. There were in every village there were a peasant organization, there were there was a trade union, and of course there was a party organizations, but there was also a library movement. And that meant that was that was the educational movement. That, those were the, the, the role of the intellectuals. Uh, and, and it was not just limited to to, 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 to higher education, it was popular oriented. But these groups later on, you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s, formed broad educational movements to, in favor of popular participation and decentralization. The, the, one can't call it NGOs, it, the, the civil society organization, people's science movement was, is the official name. Well, you know, they, they included membership-based groups, right? And there were roughly 300,000 cadres in Kerala. Kerala have some, these days, 33 million people or something. Uh, so about 300,000 people with presence out in the village. In this, many of them were school teachers, right? And, and, but also intellectual. Now, what did they do? Well, they just didn't, they, they didn't just run schools and that sort of thing, which was also important, by the way, in the nation, nationalist movement. They also uh, draw, drew up uh, uh, proposals for comprehensive reforms for alternative development in Kerala and how they should be democratically finalized and governed. So they, 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 they collected information about this, they, put forward proposals, they organized seminars, conferences, and so on about this. Uh, you didn't do that in Indonesia. <laughs> I remember when we were working in demos in the, in the 2000s, when we were, we were trying to, 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 you know, collect information and to spread the information. And we had numbers of quarrels, whether we would try to build a membership-based educational movement on the basis of all those people who contributed to the research. And, and, and they could have initiated something similar, you know. But the argument was, no, we shouldn't do that because it was dangerous. It would generate, it would generate conflicts and God knows what. So my argument is, yes, there must be, the intellectuals must play a very, very important role. And, and in the Indonesian democracy movement, it was not just intellectuals of, of a kind of, you know, in schools and, and universities and so on. The intellectuals were also increasingly important at that point of time were the journalists, the media. After the close down of Tempo de Tic and Editor in 94, they formed the core of of, 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 of a lot of the democracy movement. And of course, what you say about, you know, 
uh, uh, digital uh, use of digital uh, media and so on equals that but it has to be edited it has to be edited don't let loose everything because then you get lost and it will be taken over by by by, by conservative groups it has to be called for some editing of, of what you're doing now but the problem was that that was not combined with mass organization with popular organization and combined with development proposals. They, they had that in Kerala and they succeeded. Of course, many problems, but it was that combination that made the difference. The same thing, if you go back in social democratic development in, in Scandinavia, it, it, it's no more of that kind, but historically we can learn that lesson. Thank you very much. Yeah, jadi pada dasarnya ya, untuk merespon ke Mas Herlambang itu, peran intelektual dan uh, akademisi itu sangat penting juga ya uh, terutama untuk demokrasi di Indonesia dia juga melihat di sini adalah komparasi antara demokrasi perjuangan uh, mereka di Indonesia di Filipina dan di Kerala tapi apa sih yang membuat di Kerala lebih sukses gitu ya di sana itu semua gerakan itu terjadi di tingkat desa ada gerakan uh, petani ada juga ada gerakan uh, pendidikan di perpustakaan-perpustakaan di tingkat desa yang menurut Ola itu adalah sebuah uh, sebuah wujud gerakan intelektual tetapi yang lebih populis, populis bersama masyarakat. Di sana juga ada uh, gerakan uh, perdagangan, terus juga ada uh, kader-kader parti itu dan di 1990 terjadi sebuah uh, gerakan pendidikan gitu, seperti itu. Nah, yang menjadi menarik itu ada gerakan pendidikan, pendidikan ini yang namanya uh, science, science, people science itu didesentralisasikan di tingkat desa-desa tersebut. Nah, bayangin coba mereka itu berhasil ya dengan gerakan perpustakaan desa menghimpun 3.500 kader ke di antara 30 juta uh, penduduk di Kerala-nya sendiri. Nah, mereka itu adalah tokoh-tokoh intelektual yang merupakan pengajar di sekolah-sekolah. Nah, yang selain itu mereka membuat proposal yang dananya itu mendanai seminar konferensi. Nah, ini yang tidak ada kombinasi ini. Ada gerakan di tingkat bawah, gerakan yang memiliki isu bersama, dan mereka membuat sosial saya untuk mendanai gerakannya tersebut. Nah, suatu saat itu ya, Prof. Ole itu di Davos, di Swiss, tahun 2000 itu uh, mengumpulkan dan uh, membuat uh, membership, membership pendaftaran untuk gerakan pendidikan. Nah, uh, akhirnya uh, terjadi perkembangan-perkembangan bahwa orang itu takut untuk untuk memperjuangkan ini, takut dicap berbahaya, takut dicap melawan, gitu, seperti itu. Sehingga menurut Ole, Gerakan ini akan terjadi apabila ada kombinasi. Yang pertama, gerakan si intelektual ditambah gerakan para jurnalis. Yang sebenarnya, this is what everything is initiating ya, yeah, in all of our webinars, our intellectual discussion with other journalists themselves. Kita lihat itu sebenarnya tempo dulu di tahun 84 itu telah membuat gerakan demokrasi yang berhasil. Nah itu harus harus kita kaji ulang apa yang membuatnya sukses. Jadi oleh itu sangat sedi, tidak tidak begitu percaya dengan digital journalism karena takut kalau misalnya kita tidak mengeditkan kita tidak uh, mengitu itu akan uh, akan diambil oleh uh, mereka yang bergerak dengan pikiran konservatif tersebut. Nah gerakan tanpa proposal making itu tidak akan bergerak seperti mobil tanpa bensin seperti itu. Jadi uh, itulah pelajaran yang bisa ditangkap dari pelajaran sejarah Prof. Ola. Can I just add one thing? If you want a more recent example, which I haven't studied closely, but others have, look at Chile. Look at Chile. They were the students who are now in government. They, 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 they made they made success in their way of working. Chile, yeah. In Chile, in South America. Mm. They, they, they started, you know, with the protest movements, 
for for the for their rights or their problems related to broader social movements and 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 built up democratic alternative proposals they won the elections just to untuk mempertajam rentnya Prof Olin saya mau I want to ask you more question mm. uh, to to follow that up so the problem in Indonesia is do you think we are lack of a comprehensive uh, uh, proposal for reform <coughs> or we are lack of a uh, popular uh, support or social so civil society movement to support it or we are lack of both the historical experiences that i have had analyzed mm -hmm. suggest <clears throat> that the unity through the popular organizations and so on cannot be achieved from below i'm sorry to say it i don't think they i haven't seen any case where they managed to come together on the basis of their own priorities but i've seen examples of how they come together on the basis of re comprehensive reform proposals like the the public health reform mm. so this kind of proposals is serious of such proposals and <clears throat> you know efforts to relate these proposals anchor them embed them in popular movements okay um could you make it more explicit so if, if it's not from below so it's from above so who are the above who are the actors from above what what i was trying to say i think it's it's about embedded intellectuals okay it's about people who can 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 come listen to what is happening analyze what is happening have dialogues with what people are are experiencing try to work with the trade unions try to work with the farmers organizations and on the basis of those experiences come forward with reform proposals which are corrected and 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 further developed by these people with activist knowledge and then combine it and and they also must have power in parliament You, you 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 don't that's one way of doing it but if they are not locked up and cannot do it from within then you form think tanks you have to have your own csis mm. okay. thank you so um yeah yes so that's what you mean by uh, from above yeah jadi uh, prof ella menyampaikan barusan uh, teman-teman saya tambahin uh, mbak lia saya bantu mbak lia uh, apa dalam sejarah tidak ada proposal uh, of reform jadi agenda reformasi uh, yang berhasil jika dia sepenuhnya dari bawah jadi harus ada kekuatan dari atas nah saya bertanya lebih jauh kekuatan dari atasnya itu siapa maksudnya gitu maksudnya adalah para intelektual ya yang punya ide dan punya gagasan untuk kemudian mendapatkan uh, popular support mendapat dukungan secara luas gitu dan apakah itu berarti uh, mereka harus punya partai politik kekuatan di parlemen oleh menyampaikan tidak harus uh, tapi harus ada think tank yang kuat seperti CSIS misalnya but we already have CSIS in Indonesia and Indonesia is still like this yeah but I think you should have your CSIS yeah. <laughs> you have to have your own which is embedded not among not among the business sector yeah primarily but among the popular organizations yeah yeah we, we actually we have LBDIS yeah yes. probably yes. okay Yes. Uh, Mbak Lia, ada, ada yes. Soalnya, because uh, this is the fasting month and we have uh, a short time before we break fast. There are three uh, major questions incoming. I'll read them. You will answer, and then we just uh, uh, close close the uh, discussion of the day. The first is from Kuroto. He's uh, very skeptical. He says that there's a, a constitution law number number thirty three where uh, addressing the law for the national economic system but yet uh, this law since report is not further so uh, this this law is uh, is is close with our discussion of our idea this law has issues on public health and uh, pension but how does it connect with the reform of uh, economical reform so from elder just now we are stuck with the 7000 period of debt 
for development of this country. So he said he, he, he's very skeptical about promoting economical models for a welfare state. And then he said currently the civil society is very weak. And it's because civil society always uh, are driven by donors. So what we're facing is that the country is forcing extractive commodity for direct investment. Therefore, it's really hard uh, to, to, to juggle between social democracy and extractive commodity, which is like two, two things totally different. So he's very skeptical about our fiscal condition. So the second is from Bankit. Bankit, uh, he, he, he wants to know the progress in terms of welfare and human capital in Kerala in comparison to whole uh, India. And do you, uh, do you agree that the notion of reason authoritarianism is due to failed industrialization and deep industrialization in development countries prevented from formation of struggle middle class? Some scholars predict that the four ways of democracy in post populist will do. How, do you see a fourth wave after the first, the third wave that in your book? And the second is from Gunther. He said civil society and pro democracy groups tend to fail to consolidate, fail to moderate in democratic transition, and fail to promote principle of representation to lose legitimacy with changes in communication that tends to be horizontal in media increasing co opted. So the efforts may tend to be partial and fail to develop more effective communication with policy maker. The oppositional pattern is not so favorable to create more opposition to push desired changes to policy maker. So we also criticize that civil society is always head to head with the government. And this is not an effective communication strategy. So according to you and your experience in the story, what would be uh, a way out? So there are the three questions. I'll let you answer and then we close to this. Thank you for these questions, which I am not, I think, able to give good comprehensive answers to. Um, they call for for you know, <clears throat> one needs to sit down and 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 yeah, analyze the dis different aspects that you are that you are bringing up, which are no doubt very important. Let me only let me only uh, give a few reflections, which are not comprehensive. Then, in, in when I when I hear your questions, the first the first critical question about you know the the, the kind of economic development that is there and, and the lack of implementation of fine goals and, and, and all of that. Uh, and uh, it's mentioned many times that it should be public health and it should be this and that, but it's not implemented. I think one very vital <clears throat> thing that intellectuals could do uh, in, in the, uh, to contribute to the popular movements that, that are putting forward demands for welfare uh, uh, reforms, like trade unions and farms organizations and other very important thing that, that intellectuals can do is to analyze what particular welfare reforms that may be productive, that are not costs, but investments. And that, that there, there is research about this in comparative perspective, right? So, you know, when we go out then and come forward with proposals that we can say, come on, guys, this is not an expense, this is an investment. And that will generate better economic development in the future. It's like this, 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 and that. Uh, that calls for, now, how do we finance that? Is it, is it something which the donor can help us to finance? Maybe not, but if we can then find, if we can build up studies of this kind in combination with people working in the universities with some basic pay from the universities, 
they need not get substantial pay from donors uh, uh, to finance all these kinds of things. We need to build up a kind of independent uh, uh, studies of that, of that kind. Uh, the human capital concept in, in Kerala, well, yes, of this kind, of this particular kind, not, not, in, not, in, not 100%, but much of the emphasis on education and public health in Kerala has been productive. They may, in the sense that it has contributed to economic development. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever needs to be done in the country, whatever production requires healthy people, whatever, when, when, you, when, you, when you want to improve agricultural production, people need to be able to read and write and, and need to be able to, 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 to further develop their resources and their, their equipment and so on and so forth. That, that, that's what happened in Kerala. If anyone is fascinated with the economist Amataya Sen, I can tell you, he didn't develop his theories on his own. He was basing himself primarily on the economic develop, social development in Kerala. So it's, it's there, uh, we, can, we can study it. The problem in Kerala is that those who have utilized this, this uh, education has primarily been uh, people who have done it for their own purposes, sort of. You have educated people in Kerala who have built the airport in the Gulf areas rather than building up Kerala's own society and made their own fortunes and, and, back and, back. Built, uh, and built their houses. So it, there, there is a need for, you know, bringing people together and do make these resources and investments in Kerala. And that's what they are trying to do now. But that's, that has been a neoliberalization, you could say, of, of these efforts and certain people have benefited from them. Uh, I, I, I should probably, yeah, and, and when this failure of civil society to consolidate and, and all of that, yes, yes, I agree entirely, but, but I, I'm sorry to say, I, I don't think there is any other way of approaching that than to focus on uh, 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 coming together behind those kind of, of reform proposals combined with ideas on democratic ways of implementing those reforms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so, reflection is very critical here. Uh, there's no economic development if, if there's a lack of implementation of the ideas that were developed here. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. You're doing very well. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, a, there, this is the critical. Ini adalah titik kritis dari pembangunan ini ya, bahwa kita tidak bisa melakukan pembangunan ekonomi dengan konsep yang sedang kita bicarakan hari ini apabila tidak ada yang melakukan implementasinya seperti itu. Oke lah, kita misalnya kita bisa membawa tentang isu public health segala macam. Jadi kalau misalnya kita tidak bisa uh, menghimpun uh, apa serikat pekerja, menghimpun para petani, sama saja tidak akan ada perubahan gitu loh, seperti itu ya. Jadi memang kita harus menganalisis ya apa sih yang kita akan bisa dijadikan untuk untuk kesejahteraan. Uh, ada ide-ide bahwa kita harus bisa meyakinkan orang bahwa perubahan yang kita tawarkan itu adalah investment dan bukan pengeluaran gitu seperti itu apabila mereka ikut dalam gerakan kita. Nah sebenarnya bagaimana sih harus kita memfinance gerakan kita ya? Uh, Oke okay lah misalnya kita tidak ingin melihat dari donor, tetapi bagaimana caranya? kita mengumpulkan orang-orang yang mau sisihkan pendapatan mereka untuk tujuan gerakan yang ingin kita dorong. Maka sangat penting untuk mencari isu-isu yang uh, yang dapat menyatukan orang dalam sebuah gerakan ini. Now, tentang human capital concept pembangunan manusia. Profesor Ola melihat bahwa uh, Amartya Sen ya, our no, uh, pemenang Nobel kita itu sebenarnya belajar dari Kurala. Apa yang mereka lakukan adalah uh, semua hal itu di 
mulai gerakannya itu bukan middle class kayak di Indonesia, tetapi di tingkat desa. Gerakan-gerakan yang dikerjakan oleh aktivis-aktivis di tingkat desa. Yang uh, mereka itu, yang menurut dia paling penting adalah uh, gerakan perpustakaan itu yang tadi telah, telah di... Uh, itu paling pertama, masyarakat yang termiskin dan paling tidak terakses untuk ekonomi dan politik mereka, mereka harus bisa membaca dan menulis dan mengerti bagaimana sumber daya mereka dikelola oleh mereka sendiri. Itu dulu. Nah, setelah itu, ketika sudah uh, menjadikan, kita akan uh, uh, bagaimana itu masalah utama dari kerala itu adalah brain, brain training. Ya. Banyak dari mereka berpendidikan menjadi pintar, tapi akhirnya mereka bekerja di, di, di Timur Tengah. Di sana, di, di, di Timur Tengah, selain airport, pembangunan yang lain, itu orang-orang kerala. Kenapa harus membangun di Timur Tengah dan tidak di keralanya itu sendiri? Sehingga menurut, menurut Profesor Ola ya, gagalnya masyarakat sipil untuk bersatu setidaknya di Indonesia ini adalah itu eh, apa sih proposal yang kita dorong bersama untuk perubahan. Itu tidak ada isu bersama yang akan menyatukan semua eh, gerakan eh, ini. Jadi coba fokus untuk me menyelesaikan konsep itu sebelum itu akhirnya bisa bersama. Baik, uh, that's all for today, our discussion. Thank you so much for being uh, here. Yeah, before we close, I will give to the provoker. Just one, one minute question. Go ahead. What do you think the Chinese system, that is computer system, social system, or what? Sorry, I, I didn't get you. Can you take? What? In China. In China. Yeah, what, what do you think the Chinese now, the, the China now? The, the, what what the what do you think China system now? Ch China's political economy, yeah, uh, it is a socialist system or China is capitalist system. What do you think? What system is that? <laughs> so uh, they are not a socialism anymore. So moving to socialism and then becoming success. So move uh, China from communism socialism moving to capitalism, state capitalism, then they believe they are a success. So they are leaving the uh, socialist system. So I mean, they, 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 they failed to link up very scattered, you know, people's communes, production in people's communes and so on. They failed to organize that in an integrated way. They failed with the linkages. They didn't have any democratic way of governing the people's communes in linkages. So what did they do? They resorted to guided markets, state guided markets. That's Deng Xiaoping. That's how they opened up for this. And now they, you have these markets regulated by the states, by the state. You even have a supposedly communist party where oligarchs are members. That is nothing but, but a kind of statist capitalism. They failed to build and integrate it in a democratic way. Yeah, but they still, they, 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 that is their way. That's their way, yes. And uh, become the largest uh, economy in the world now, and they contribute that one, uh, which is different from the previous socialist communist system. So they move to... Yes, 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 if you want that. I mean, social democracy is needs-oriented development based on social equality by democratic means. They promote, they, they, that, they did nothing of that. Why, why don't you think like Germany? Mm -hmm. In Germany, before three months, and that's because of their values, you know, social responsibility, communalism, socialism, and this combination between the market capitalism and social responsibility. So they move to that mm -hmm. and then become a social market. Yeah. From capitalism, move to social market. But the China moved from socialist country to state capitalism. So this yeah. is the way they. Yeah, yeah. You, could, you could say similar things of. of 
you could say similar things of Singapore, if you like. But then you have to admit the fact that their capital is rents coming from Indonesia, coming from other countries. In the, Singapore looks fine, but it's the most rentier country you can come to think of. And China is based on uh, what Kemal Glo and the others said. Uh, you know, they have, they have exploited people uh, to build up this in a very rapid way, by in a, in a very, very undemocratic, very, very undemocratic way. Yes, they have made economic progress, <clears throat> but it has entirely been based on <clears throat> what is necessary. Uh, what, what, sorry, it has been entirely based on undemocratic means. And it has been based on the demands, on the demands on the global world market, not by needs-based development. So we saw that in, uh, Singapore is the Negara, apa namanya, Negara Gawar Darurat System. Yes. Emergency System, everything is controlled by the state. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, Umum masih belum buka ya, Mbak? Yes, yes. Satu, satu saja, <coughs> yang terakhir. Uh, dari tadi kan uh, Prof. Ole menyebut tentang tidak adanya gerakan sosial atau gerakan masyarakat sipil yang kuat untuk mendukung uh, program yang reformis. Gitu. Uh, ta tapi pertanyaannya kemudian adalah mengapa tidak ada gerakan sosial yang kuat? So um, I, I will translate it. So uh, you mentioned uh, repeatedly about the lack of social movement, right, to support in Indonesia to support. Uh, Uh, proposal for reform. Hmm. Yeah, but the question will be why we why we are lack of it then. Sorry, the question is the question is actually why we are lack of uh, the social movement. Uh, um, uh, in your writing here, you you suggest you know that this is actually my initial comment that you haven't addressed about the the, the link uh, about the new lab uh, 1965 something like that mm. could could you elaborate further about it because some theories yeah some some observers uh, suggest that a, a trauma in the past become the you know become the uh, become the obstacle for yes. for a genuine yes. social yes. movement what I, what I'm... <laughs> you're you're challenging me to be provocative But <laughs> and, and, a, and a little bit presumptuous as well. Now, anyway, uh, what I what I am saying is that the root of the crisis of the present progressive movement in Indonesia is based on the mistake in the late 50s of supporting left populist guided democracy. Mm -hmm. Then, then you gave up on democratization. Then you gave up on that route. Mm. Huh. And then there wasn't any alternative to, to really fight the, this, those people capturing the state and, and working through the state. And then people were massacred and the, ma and the mass movements disappeared. And there wasn't any kind of alternative in that respect. Then come these remarkable, brave activists like Arif Buriman and others come back to Indonesia, but they couldn't, of course, build popular movements on their own and, 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 and were focusing on civil society activities which didn't have a mass, which didn't have a mass base. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and, and yeah, we can continue, but, but I think we need to acknowledge that Mm. that history to understand the problems and opportunities today. Okay. Okay. Yeah, saya akan uh, terjemahkan untuk uh, teman-teman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, jawaban atas pertanyaan saya tadi, uh, mengapa tidak ada gerakan sosial yang kuat di Indonesia dan bagaimana hubungannya itu dengan trauma 65? Menurut Ola, uh, dulu uh, kita punya gerakan sosial yang kuat sebenarnya dalam sejarah kita ya. Nah, sayangnya gerakan sosial yang kuat itu kemudian digunakan untuk mendukung guided demokrasi, uh, mendukung otoritarisme ya. Lalu kemudian dia berujung pada pembunuhan massal uh, tahun 65 itu. Uh, lalu kemudian uh, sejak itu 
kita seakan-akan meninggalkan gitu jalur yang sebenarnya sudah benar yaitu bahwa uh, agenda politik yang bagus yang reformis yang dalam hal ini welfare state itu sebenarnya butuh popular support gitu. Jadi artinya ketika popular support pernah gagal di masa lalu kemudian tidak berarti kita meninggalkan popular support itu gitu. Tapi kita perlu untuk uh, membangun lagi popular support tapi untuk untuk satu program yang benar ya dalam hal kutip ya dalam hal ini adalah uh, uh, new new social democracy tadi yaitu uh, membangun uh, pertumbuhan ekonomi ke membangun uh, kesejahteraan uh, ya kesejahteraan ekonomi secara adil tapi dengan cara-cara yang uh, demokratis kira-kira begitu uh, apa uh, menurut uh, pikiran uh, oleh I think uh, that that would be that's a strong end ya for today Uh, but yeah, you can uh, close the session. Sorry for being so presumptuous. I, I, but but those are the conclusions from my studies. There must be many other studies added to that. Yeah. But can you can you mix your theory with the reality of the system? I mean, uh, you mentioned the health reform, right? Yes. Uh, success on health insurance reform. Yes. I think I think it was a remarkable achievement. Yeah. I think it was it was the yeah. beginning of something which could have been, yeah. you know, fabulously successful yeah. if it had been continued with additional similar reforms, yeah. and and if it had been associated those reforms with the, with an idea of how to have participatory governance of these reforms. How this can be uh, happen? How it can happen? No, not, uh, not because of populism, but it is on this in simple elite uh, consensus and uh, constitutional reform in the uh, parliament. I just want to inform the then. No, I'm, I'm just saying they managed they managed to draw up such alternatives in Chile. They are now in government. They were students. No, that, that, that started. They started as a student no, that movement. That started actually from the conception of Amna. Yes, they started, but that wasn't the beginning of it. The beginning were extensive student protests against, you know, repression, against against very poor conditions for the students and everyone in the in the public sector and so on and so forth. The neoliberalism. Then they advanced by broadening the movement and so on and so forth. The objective of the student movement, the unique thing was that they didn't only limit it to their own interest, they broadened it. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Bapak Ibu semua, uh, akhirnya waktulah yang harus memisahkan kita. Terima kasih uh, telah hadir ya dalam diskusi yang sangat menarik hari ini dan dengan pertanyaan-pertanyaan juga sangat menarik dan berbobot. Semoga Bapak Ibu sekalian bisa bergabung kembali di diskusi diskusi yang akan terjadi di depan. Thank you so much for all to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We unite together in the movement for social reform. Thank you so much. Saya Liangra ini undur diri sampai bertemu di lain kesempatan. Thank you.